Hello, everybody. How you doing? Hello. Happy Friday evening to everybody. Um, hope you're doing good. Uh, let me know if the music's too loud, as per usual. I know you guys usually tell me if something's not right, but hello. We're starting a new book today. We are starting the fourth book in a series of unfortunate events. I hope everybody's doing really well. Um, I am having a super weird week, <laughs> but uh, everything seems to be getting better. Up and up, had a couple little medical scares that were uh, fun fun to deal with. I don't know if fun is definitely not the word. Um, but anyway, uh, I feel like the music might still be a little loud. Hey Rob, how are you doing? Um, let me just cut this down a little bit. Is that okay? Is that good? Um, okay. Anyway, I'm not really going to have a whole lot of uh, intro to this, so I'm just going to jump right in. But before I do, I just want to give a quick shout out to somebody. Um, I just want to give a shout out to my loyal YouTube viewer, Annalie. Um, who comments on everything that I do. I love your passive aggressive comments toward me um, and your obvious distaste of everything that I do on my channel that is not read Lemony Snicket. So I just wanted to give you a quick shout out. I hope you're happy that I'm uploading this and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And with that being said, we'll start. I'm gonna f first start out by reading the back of the book. Dear reader, I hope, for your sake, that you have not chosen to read this book because you are in the mood for a pleasant experience. If this is the case, I advise you to put this book down instantaneously because of all of the books describing the unhappy lives of the Baudelaire orphans, the miserable mill might be the unhappiest yet. Violet Claus and Sunny Baudelaire are sent to Paltryville to work in a lumber mill and they find disaster and misfortune lurking behind every log. The pages of this book, I'm sorry to inform you, contain such unpleasantries as a giant pincher machine, a bad casserole, a man with a cloud of smoke where his head should be, a hypnotist, a terrible accident resulting in injury, and coupons. I have promised to write down the entire history of these three poor children, but you haven't, so if you prefer stories that are more heartwarming, please feel free to make another selection. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Hi, Riddy. And hi, Smokey. <clears throat> so that's the intro to the book. All right, here we go. Thank you all for being here, and we're gonna get jump. We're gonna jump right in. Check my reminder for anybody new who may be here. To Beatrice, my love flew like a butterfly until death swooped down like a bat, as the poet Emma Montana McElroy said. That's the end of that. Chapter 1 Sometimes during your life, in fact very soon, you may find yourself reading a book, and you may notice that a book's first sentence can often tell you what sort of story your book contains. For instance, a book that began with the sentence, Once upon a time there was a family of cunning little chipmunks who lived in a hollow tree, would probably contain a story full of talking animals who would get into all sorts of mischief. A book that began with the sentence, Emily sat down and looked down at the stack of blueberry pancakes her mother had prepared for her, but she was too nervous about Camp Timbertops to eat a bite. Would probably contain a story full of giggly girls who have a grand old time. And a book that began with the sentence, Gary smelled the leather of his brand new catcher's mitt and waited impatiently for his best friend Larry to come around the corner, would probably contain a story full of sweaty boys who win some sort of trophy. And if you liked mischief, or grand old time, or trophies, you would know which book to read, and you could throw the rest of them away. <laughs> but this book begins with the sentence, The Baudelaire orphans looked out the grimy window of the train and gazed at the gloomy blackness of the finite forest, wondering if their lives would ever get any better. And you should be able to tell that the story that follows will be very different from the story of Gary or Emily or the family of cunning little chipmunks. And this is for the simple reason that the lives of Violet Klaus and Sunny Baudelaire are very different from most people's lives, with the main difference being the amount of unhappiness, horror, and despair. The three children have no time to get into all sorts of mischief because misery follows them wherever they go. They have not had a grand old time since their parents died in a terrible fire, and the only trophy they would win would be some sort of first prize for wretchedness. 
It is atrociously unfair, of course, that the Bodlers have so many troubles, but that is the way the story goes. So now that I've told you that the first sentence will be the Bodler orphans looked out the grimy window of the train and gazed at the gloomy blackness of the finite forest, wondering if their lives would ever get any better, if you wish to avoid any unpleasant story, that you had, then you had better put this book down. The Bodler orphans looked out the grimy window of the train and gazed at the gloomy blackness of the finite forest, wondering if their lives would ever get any better. An announcement over a crackly loudspeaker had just told them that in a few minutes they would arrive in the town of Paltryville, where their new caretaker lived. And they couldn't help wondering who in this world would want to live in such a dark and eerie countryside. Violet, who was 14, and the eldest Baudelaire looked out at the trees of the forest, which were very tall and had practically no branches, so they looked almost like metal pipes instead of trees. Violet was an inventor and was always designing machines and devices in her head, with her hair tied up in a ribbon to help her think, and as she gazed out at the trees, she began to work on a mechanism that would allow you to climb to the top of any tree, even if it were completely bare. Klaus, who was 12, looked down at the forest floor, who, which was covered in brown, patchy moss. Klaus liked to read more than anything else, and he tried to remember what he had read about Paltryville mosses and whether any of them were edible. And Sunny, who was just an infant, looked out at the smoky gray sky that hung over the forest like a damp sweater. Sunny had four sharp teeth, and biting things with them was what interested her most, and she was eager to see what there was available to bite in the area. But even as Violet began planning her invention and Klaus thought of his moss research and Sunny opened and closed her mouth as a pre-biting exercise, the finite forest looked so uninspiring that they couldn't help wondering if their new home would really be a pleasant one. "'What a lovely forest!' Mr. Poe remarked and coughed into a white handkerchief. Mr. Poe was a banker who had been in charge of managing the Baudelaire affairs since the fire, and I must tell you that he was not doing a very good job. His two main duties were finding the orphans a good home and protecting the enormous fortune that the children's parents had left behind, and so far each home, each home had been a catastrophe, a word which here means an utter disaster involving tragedy, deception, and Count Olaf. Count Olaf was a terrible man who wanted the Baudelaire fortune for himself and tried every disgusting scheme he could think of to steal it. Time after time he had come very close to succeeding, and time after time the Baudelaire orphans had revealed his plan, and time after time he had escaped, and all Mr. Poe had ever done was cough. Now he was accompanying the children to Paltryville, and it pains me to tell you that once again Count Olaf would appear with yet another disgusting scheme, and that Mr. Poe would once again fail to do anything even remotely helpful. What a lovely forest, Mr. Poe said again when he was done coughing. I think you children will have a good home here. I hope you do anyway, because I've just received a promotion at Mulchery Money Management. I'm now the vice president in charge of coins, and from now on I will be busier than ever. If anything goes wrong with you here, I will have to send you to boarding school until I have time to find you another home, so please be on your best behavior. Of course, Mr. Poe, Violet said, not adding that she and her siblings had always been on their best behavior, but that it hadn't done them any good. "'What is our new caretaker's name?' Klaus asked. "'You didn't tell us.' Mr. Poe took a piece of paper out of his pocket and squinted at it. "'His name is Mr. Was... Mr. Quay... I can't pronounce it. It's very long and complicated.' "'Can I see?' Klaus asked. "'Maybe I could figure out how to pronounce it.' "'No, no,' Mr. Poe said, putting the paper away. "'If it's too complicated for an adult, it is much too complicated for a child.' "'Gand!' Sonny shrieked. Like many infants, Sunny spoke mostly in sounds that were often difficult to translate. This time she probably meant something like, but Klaus reads many complicated books. He'll tell you what to call him, Mr. Poe continued as if Sunny had not spoken. You'll find him at the main office of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, which I'm told is a short walk from the train station. Aren't you coming with us? Violet asked. No, Mr. Poe said and coughed again into his handkerchief. The train only stops at Paltryville once a day, so if I got off the train, I would have to stay overnight and I'd miss another day at the bank. I'm just dropping you off here and heading right back into the city. The Baudelaire orphans looked worriedly out the window. They weren't very happy about just being dropped off in a strange place as if they were a pizza being delivered instead of three children all alone in the world. What if Count Olaf shows up? Klaus asked quietly. He swore he'd find us again. I have given Dr... Mr. Beck, uh, Mr. Dewey, I've given your new caretaker a complete description of Count Olaf, Mr. Poe said. So if by some stretch of the imagination he shows up in Paltryville, Mr. Show, Mr. Geck will, will notify the authorities. But Count Olaf is always in disguise, Violet pointed out. It's often difficult to recognize him. Just about the only way you can tell it's him is if you see that tattoo of an eye that he has on his ankle. I included the tattoo in my description, Mr. Poe said impatiently. 
But what about Count Olaf's assistants? Kaf said. He usually brings at least one of them with him to help out with his treachery. I described all of them to Mr. I've described all of them to the owner of the mill, Mr. Poe said, holding up a finger as he counted all of Olaf's horrible associates. The hook-handed man, the bald man with the long nose, two women with white powder all over their faces, and that rather chubby one who looks like neither a man nor a woman. Your new guardian is aware of them all, and if there's any problem, remember you can always contact me or any of my associates at Moultrie Money Management. Casca, Sunny said glumly. She probably meant something like, that's not very reassuring, but nobody heard her over the sound of the train whistle as they arrived in Paltryville Station. Here we are, Mr. Poe said, and before the children knew it, they were standing in the station, watching the train pull away into the dark trees of the finite forest. The clattering noise of the train engine got softer and softer as the train raced out of sight, and soon the three siblings were all alone indeed. Well, Violet said, picking up the small bag that contained the children's few clothes. Let's find the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, then we can meet our new caretaker. Or at least learn his name, Klaus said glumly and took Sonny's hand. If you are ever planning a vacation, you may find it useful to acquire a guidebook, which is a book listing interesting and pleasant places to visit and giving helpful hints about what to do when you arrive. Paltryville is not listed in any guidebook, and as the Baudelaire orphans trudged down Paltryville's one street, they instantly saw why. There were a few small shops on either side of the street, but none of them had any windows. There was a post office, but instead of a flag flying from the flagpole, there was only an old shoe dang dangling from the top of it. And across from the post office was a high wooden wall that ran all the way to the end of the street. In the middle of the wall was a tall gate, also made of wood, with the words Lucky Smells Lumber Mill written on it in letters that looked rough and slimy. Alongside the sidewalk, where a row of trees might have been, were towering stacks of old newspapers instead. In short, everything that had been that might make a town interesting or pleasant had been made boring or unpleasant, and if Poultryville had been listed in a guidebook, the only helpful hint about what to do when you got there would be leave. But the three youngsters couldn't leave, of course, and with a sigh, Violet led her younger siblings to the wooden gate. She was about to knock when Klaus touched, on her, touched her on the shoulder and said, Look... I know, she said. Violet thought he was talking about the letter spelling out Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Now that they were standing at the gate, the children could see why the letters looked rough and slimy. They were made of wads and wads of chewed up gum, just stuck on the gate in the shapes of letters. Other than a sign I saw once that said beware in letters made of dead monkeys, the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill sign was the most disgusting sign on earth, and Violet thought her brother was pointing that out. But when she turned to agree with him, she saw he wasn't looking at the sign, but down to the far end of the street. Look, Klaus said again, but Violet had already seen what he was looking at. The two of them stood there without speaking a word, staring hard at the building at the end of Poultryville's one street. Sunny had been examining some of the teeth marks in the gum, but when her siblings fell silent, she looked up and saw it too. For a few seconds, the Baudelaire orphans just looked. It must be a coincidence, Violet said after a long pause. Of course... Klaus said nervously, a coincidence. Varney, Sunny agreed, but she didn't believe it. None of the orphans did. Now that the children had reached the mill, they could see another building at the far end of the street. Like the other buildings in town, it had no windows, just a round door in the center. But it was the way the building was shaped and how it was painted that made the Baudelaire stare. The building was a sort of oval shape with curved skinny sticks sticking out of the top of it. Most of the oval was painted a brownish color with a big circle of white inside the oval and a smaller circle of green inside the white circle and some little black steps led to a little round door that was painted black so it looked like an even smaller circle inside the green one. The building had been made to look like an eye. The three children looked at one another and then at the building and then at each other again, shaking their heads. Try as they might, they just couldn't believe it was a coincidence that the town in which they were to live had a building that looked just like the tattoo of Count Olaf. End of chapter one. Let me catch up on all this chat. Hi, Riddy. Hi, Tom. Lachlan, hey! Hey, Lachlan. Hey, Nicole. Oh, this is your favorite Unfortunate Events book? <laughs> That's really funny because it's my least favorite. <laughs> I'm 
I'm sorry. Not that I dislike it, but it's just funny. You love the subtle Pokemon music in the back? Thank you for the host, Riddy. Yeah, I figured Pokemon music would be kind of neutral to have in the back. Oh, I'm sorry that I missed you, Lachlan. Aw. Hi, Heartless. How am I doing? I am doing pretty good. Um, I'm doing much better now than I was. I don't know if you saw my stream yesterday or caught it, but um, had a couple medical scares this week uh, that I got taken care of. Um, so that's good. I do have to have a little bit of a procedure done um, on Tuesday. But other than that, I'm doing much better. Um, so all that good stuff. Yeah, we have the same favorite in indie game, but completely different, unfortunate events. That's pretty funny. However, variety is the spice of life, am I right? Okay. I think that's all. If you guys are ready for chapter two, we'll buckle on in for chapter two. You so, I, yeah, I so right. I am doing much better. <laughs> I didn't really make up my bed very well before I streamed. Sorry if you guys can see my uh, in shambles um, comforter. You may not be able to, though, but that's okay. Hey, Corvid, how are you doing? My night is pretty good. Now that I'm finally home from work, it has been very nice. All right, I'm going to jump into chapter two now. <clears throat> chapter two. It is much, much worse to receive bad news through the written word than by somebody simply telling you. And I'm sure you understand why. When somebody simply tells you bad news, you hear it once and that's the end of it. But when bad news is written down, whether in a letter or a newspaper or on your arm in a felt tip pen, each time you read it, you feel as if you're receiving that news again and again. For instance, I once loved a woman who, for various reasons, could not marry me. If she had simply told me in person, I would have been very sad, of course, but eventually it might have passed. However, she chose instead to write a 200-page book explaining every single detail of the bad news at great length, and instead my sadness has been of impossible depth. When the book was first brought to me by a flock of carrier pigeons, I stayed up all night reading it, and I read it still, and I read it still, over and over. And it is as if my darling Beatrice is bringing me bad news every day and every night of my life. The Bodler orphans knocked again and again on the wooden gate, taking care not to hit the chewed up gum letters with their knuckles. But nobody answered and at last they tried the gate themselves and found that it was unlocked. Behind the gate was a large courtyard with a dirt floor and on the dirt floor was an envelope with the word Baudelaire's typed on the front. Klaus picked up the envelope and opened it and inside was a note that read as follows. Memorandum. To the Baudelaire Orphans, from Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. Subject, your arrival. Enclosed, you will find a map of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, including the dormitory where the three of you will be staying free of charge. Please report to work the following morning along with the other employees. The owner of Lucky Smells Lumber Mill expects you to be both assiduous and diligent. What do those words mean, assiduous and diligent? Violet asked, peering over Klaus's shoulders. Assiduous and diligent both mean the same thing said Klaus, who knew lots of impressive words from all the books he'd read. Hard working. But Mr. Poe didn't say anything about working in the lumber mill, Violet said. I thought we were just going to live here. Klaus frowned at the hand-drawn map that was attached to the note, with another wad of gum. This map looks pretty easy to read, he said. The dormitory is straight ahead between the storage shed and the lumber mill itself. Violet looked straight ahead and saw a gray windowless building on the other side of the courtyard. I don't want to live, she said, between the storage shed and the lumber mill itself. It doesn't sound like much fun, Klaus admitted, but you never know. The mill might have complicated machines and you would find it interesting to study them. That's true, Violet said. You never know. It might have some hard wood and Sunny would find it interesting to bite it. Snevy, Sunny shrieked. And there might be some interesting lumber mill manuals for me to read, Klaus said. You never know. That's right, Violet said. You never know. This might be a wonderful place to live. The three siblings looked at one another and felt a little better. It is true, of course, that you never know. A new experience can be extremely pleasurable or extremely irritating or somewhere in between, and you never know until you try it out. 
And as the children began walking toward the gray windowless building, they felt ready to try out their new home at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill because you never know. But, and my heart aches to tell you this, I always know. I know because I have been to the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill and learned of all the atrocious things that befell these poor orphans during the brief time they lived there. I know because I have talked to some of the people who were there at the time and heard with my own ears the troublesome story of the children's stay in Poultryville. And I know because I have written down all the details in order to convey to you, the reader, just how miserable this er their experience was. I know, and this knowledge sits heavy in my heart, heavy as a paperweight. I wish I could have been at the lumber mill when the Bodlers were there because they didn't know. I wish I could tell them what I know as they walked across the courtyard raising small clouds of dust with every step. They didn't know, but I know and I wish they knew, if you know what I mean. When the Bodlers reached the door of the gray building, Klaus took another look at the map, nodded his head, and knocked. After a long pause, the door creaked open and revealed a confused-looking man whose clothes were covered in sawdust. He stared at them for quite some time before speaking. No one's knocked on this door, he said finally, for 14 years. Sometimes when somebody says something so strange that you don't know what to say in return, it is best to just politely say, how do you do? How do you do, Violet said politely. I'm Violet Baudelaire, and these are my siblings, Klaus and Sonny. The confused looking man looked even more confused and put his hands on his hips, brushing off some sawdust and uh, brushing some of the sawdust off of his shirt. Are you sure you're in the right place? He asked. I think so, Klaus said. This is the dormitory at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, isn't it? Yes, the man said, but we're not allowed to have visitors. We're not visitors, Klaus replied. We're going to live here. The man scratched his head and the Baudelaire's watched as sawdust fell out of his messy gray hair. You're going to live here? At the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill? Seagam, Sunny shrieked, which meant look at this note. So Klaus gave the note to the man, who was careful not to touch the gum as he read it over. Then he looked down at the orphans with his tired, sawdust-sprinkled eyes. You're going to work here, too. Children working in a lumber mill is a very difficult job. Trees have to be stripped of their bark and sawed into narrow strips to make boards. The boards have to be tied together into stacks and loaded onto trucks. I, I must tell you that the majority of people who work in the lumber business are grown-ups, but if the owner says you're working here, I guess you're working here. You'd better come inside. The man opened the door further, and the Bodler stepped inside the dormitory. My name's Phil, by the way, Phil said. You can join us for dinner in a few minutes, but in the meantime, I'll give you a tour of the dormitory. Phil led the youngsters into a large, dimly lit room filled with bunk beds, standing in rows and rows on a cement floor. People sitting or lying down on the bunk. Sitting or lying down on the bunks were an assortment of people, men and women, all of whom looked tired and all of whom were covered in sawdust. They were sitting together in groups of four or five, playing cards, chatting quietly, or simply staring into space, and a few of them looked up with mild interest as the three siblings walked into the room. The whole place had a damp smell, a smell rooms get when the windows have not been opened for quite some time. Of course, in this case, the windows had never been opened because there weren't any windows, although the children could see that somebody had taken a ballpoint pen and drawn a few windows on the gray cement walls. The window drawing somehow made the room even more pathetic a word which here means depressing and containing no windows, and the Bodler orphans felt a lump in their throats just looking at it. This here's the room where we sleep, Phil said. There's a bunk over there in the far corner that you three can have. You can store your bag underneath the bed. Through that door is the bathroom, and down that hallway over there is the kitchen. That's pretty much the grand tour. Everyone, this is Violet, Klaus, and Sunny. They're going to work here. But they're children, one of the women said. I know, Phil said, but the owner says they're going to work here, so they're going to work here. By the way, Klaus said, what is the owner's name? No one's told us. I don't know, Phil said, stroking his dusty chin. He hasn't visited the dormitory for uh, six years or so. Does anybody remember the owner's name? I think it's Mr. or something, one of the men said. You mean you never talked to him? Violet asked. We never even see him, Phil said. The owner lives in a house across from the storage shed and only comes to the lumber mill for special occasions. We see the foreman all the time, but never the owner. Taruka? Sonny asked, which probably meant, what's a foreman? A foreman, Klaus explained, is someone who supervises workers. Is he nice, Phil? He's awful, one of the other men said, and some of the others took up the cry. He's terrible. He's disgusting. He's revolting. He's the worst foreman the world has ever seen. 
He is pretty bad, Phil said to the Baudelaire's. The guy we used to have, Foreman Fierstein, was okay. But last week he stopped showing up. It was very odd. The man who replaced him, Foreman Flacatono, is very mean. You'll stay on his good side if you know what's good for you. He doesn't have a good side, a woman said. Now, now, Phil said, everything and everybody's got a good side. Come on, let's have our supper. The Bodler orphans smiled at Phil and followed the other employees of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill into the kitchen, but they still had lumps in their throats as big as the lumps in the beef casserole that they ate for supper. The children could tell from Phil's statement about everything and everybody having a good side that he was an optimist. Optimist is a word which here refers to a person such as Phil who thinks hopeful and pleasant thoughts about nearly everything. For instance, if an optimist had his left arm chewed off by an alligator, he might say in a pleasant and hopeful voice, well, this isn't too bad. I don't have my left arm anymore, but at least nobody will ever ask me whether I'm right-handed or left-handed. But most of us would say something more along the lines of, ah, my arm, my arm. The Bodler orphans ate their damp casserole and they tried to be the optimists like Phil, but at tries they might, none of their thoughts turned out to be pleasant or hopeful. They thought of the bunk bed they would share in the smelly room with windows drawn on the walls. They thought of doing hard work in the lumber mill, getting sawdust all over them and being bossed around by Foreman Flacutono. They thought of the eye-shaped building outside the wooden gate, and most of all, they thought of their parents. Their poor parents, whom they missed so much, and whom they'd never see again. They thought all through supper, and they thought while changing into their pajamas, and they thought as Violet tossed and turned in the top bunk, and Klaus and Sunny tossed and turned below her. They thought, as they did in the courtyard, that you never know, and that their home could still be a wonderful one. But they could guess. And as the Lucky Smells employees snored around them, the children thought about all their unhappy circumstances and began guessing. They tossed and turned and guessed and guessed, and by the time they fell asleep, there was not a single optimist in the Baudelaire bunk. That's the end of chapter two. What if you were left-handed? Then you that would be terrible to lose your left arm. Yeah, Smokey, exactly. My arm, my arm. are having a good time we're already halfway done for tonight's session i'm gonna read four chapters and um i'm gonna do four four and five is how i'm gonna break it up learning new tricks because this alligator has provided me with a sharp learning tool I know I've noticed that like sometimes I'm getting like a little laggy just in my video but not in my audio and I can't really explain that I'm sorry I'm in the process of forcing ambidextrous upon my useless left hand for completely unfound fear of losing my right hand <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it's probably a good skill to teach yourself how to be ambidextrous <laughs> I've always, I've always been a little bit, like, jealous of people who are, like, naturally ambidextrous, you know? I, I had known, um, a, a guy in college who was, like, legit ambidextrous. Reasons, Riddy, reasons. <clears throat> Alright, I'm gonna go into chapter three. Chapter three. Morning is an important time of day, because how you spend your morning can often tell you what kind of day you're going to have. For instance, if you wake up to the sound of twittering birds and find yourself in an enormous canopy bed with a butler standing next to you holding a breakfast of freshly made muffins and hand-screeched orange juice on a silver tray, you know that your day is going to be a splendid one. 
If you wake up to the sound of church bells and find yourself in a fairly big, regular bed with a butler standing next to you holding a breakfast of hot tea and toast on a plate, you know your day is going to be okay. And if you wake up to the sound of somebody banging two metal pots together and find yourself in a small bunk bed with a nasty foreman standing in the doorway holding no breakfast at all, you could probably guess your day is going to be horrid. You and I, of course, cannot be too surprised that the Bodler's first day at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill was a horrid one. And the Bodler's certainly did not expect twittering birds or a butler, not after their dismaying arrival. But never in their most uneasy dreams did they expect the cacophony, a word which here means the sound of two metal pots being banged together by a nasty foreman standing in the doorway holding no breakfast at all, that awoke them. Get up, you lazy, smelly things, cried the foreman in an odd-sounding voice. He spoke as if he were covering his mouth with his hands. Time for work, everybody. There's a new shipment of logs just waiting to be made into lumber. The children sat up and rubbed their eyes. All around them, the employees of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill were stretching and covering their ears at the sound of the pots. Phil, who was already up and making his bunk neatly, gave the Baudelaire's a tired smile. Good morning, Baudelaire's, Phil said. And good morning, Foreman Flacatono. May I introduce you to your three newest employees? Foreman Flacatono, this is Violet Claus and Sunny Baudelaire. I heard we'd have some new workers, the foreman said, dropping the pots to the floor with a clatter. But nobody told me they'd be midgets. We're not midgets, Violet explained. We're children. Children? Midgets? What do I care? Foreman Flacatono said in his muffled voice, walking over to the orphan's bunk. All I care is that you get out of bed this instant and go straight up to the mill. The Baudelaire's hopped out of the bunk bed, not wanting to anger the man who banged pots together instead of saying good morning. But once they got a good look at Foreman Flacatona, they wanted to hop back into their bunks and pull the covers over their heads. I'm sure you've heard it said that appearance does not matter so much, and that it is what is on the inside that counts. This is, of course, utter nonsense, because if it were true, then people who were good on the inside would never have to comb their hair or take a bath, and the whole world would smell even worse than it already does. Appearance matters a great deal, because you can often tell a lot about people by looking at how they present themselves. And it was the way Foreman Flacatono presented himself that made the orphans want to jump back into their bunks. He was wearing stained overalls, which never make a good impression, and his shoes were taped shut instead of being tied up with laces. But it was the foreman's head that was the most unpleasant. Foreman Flacatono was bald, as bald as an egg, but rather than admit to being bald like sens sensible people do, he had purchased a curly white wig that made it look like he had a bunch of large dead worms all over his head. Some of the worm hairs stuck straight up, and some of them curled off to one side, and some of them ran down his ears and his forehead, and a few of them stretched straight out ahead as if they wanted to escape from Foreman Flacatono's scalp. Below his wig was a pair of dark and beady eyes which blinked at the orphans in a most unpleasant way. As for the rest of his face, it was impossible to tell what it looked like because it was covered with a cloth mask, such as doctors wear when they are in hospitals. Foreman Flacatono's nose was all curled up under the mask like an alligator hiding in the hiding in the mud, and when he spoke, the Baudelaire's could see his mouth opening and closing behind the cloth. It is perfectly proper to wear these masks in hospitals, of course, to stop the spreading of germs, but it makes no sense if you're the foreman of Lucky Smell's lumber mill. The only reason Foreman Flacatono could have for wearing a surgical mask would be to frighten people, and as he peered down at the Baudelaire orphans, they were quite frightened indeed. The first thing you could do, Baudelaire's... I'm sorry. The first thing you can do, Baudelaire's... Foreman Flacatono said, is pick up my pots and never make me drop them again. But we didn't make you drop them, Klaus said. Bram, Sonny added, which probably meant something like, and our last name is Baudelaire. If you don't pick up the pots this instant, Foreman Flacatono said, you will get no chewing gum for lunch. The Baudelaire orphans did not care much for chewing gum, particularly peppermint chewing gum, which they were allergic to, but they ran the, to the pots. Violet picked one up and Sonny picked up the other while Klaus hurriedly made the beds. Give them to me, Foreman Flacatono snapped and grabbed the pots out of the girls' hands. Now, workers, we've wasted enough time already. To the mills! Logs are waiting for us. I hate log days, one of the employees grumbled, but everyone followed Foreman Flacatono out of the dormitory and across the dirt-floored courtyard to the lumber mill, which was a dull gray building with many smokestacks sticking out of the top like porcupine quills. The three children looked at one another worriedly. Except for one summer day, back when their parents were still alive when the Baudelaire's had opened a lemonade stand in front of their house, the orphans had never had jobs, and they were nervous. The Baudelaire's followed Foreman Flacatono into the lumber mill and saw that it was all one huge room filled with enormous machines. Violet looked at a shiny steel machine with a pair of steel pinchers like the arms of a crab and tried to figure out how this invention worked. 
Klaus examined a machine that looked like a big cage with an enormous ball of string trapped inside and tried to remember what he had read about lumber mills. Sonny stared at a rusty, creaky-looking machine that had a circular saw blade that looked quite jagged and fearsome and wondered if it was sharper than her own teeth. And all three Baudelaire's gazed at a machine covered in tiny smokestacks and held a, that held a huge flat stone up in the air and wondered what in the world it was doing there. The Boulders had only had a few seconds to be curious about these machines, however, before Foreman Flacatono began clanging his two pots together and barking out orders. The logs, he shouted. Turn on the pincher machine and get started with the logs. Phil ran to the pincher machine and pressed an orange button on it. With a rough whistling noise, the pinchers opened and stretched out toward the far wall of the lumber mill. The orphans had been so curious about the machines that they hadn't noticed the huge pile of trees that were stacked, leaves and roots and all, along one wall of the lumber mill as if a giant had simply torn a small forest out of the ground and dropped it into the room. The pinchers picked up the tree on top of the stack and began lowering it to the ground while Foreman Flacutono banged his pots together and shouted, The DeBarkers! The DeBarkers! Another employee walked to the back corner of the room where there was a stack of tiny green boxes and a pile of flat metal rectangles as long and as thin as an adult eel. Without a word, she picked up the pile of rectangles and began distributing them to the workers. Take a debarker, she whispered to the children, one each. The children took a rectangle and stood there, confused and hungry, just as the tree touched the ground. Foreman Flacatono clanged his pots together again and the empty and the employees crowded around the tree and began scraping against it with their debarkers, filing the bark off each tree as you or I might file our nails. You two midgets, the foreman shouted, and the children found room among the adults to scrape away at the tree. Phil had described the rigors of working in a lumber mill, and it had certainly sounded difficult. But as you remember, Phil was an optimist, so the actual work turned out to be much, much worse. For one thing, the debarkers were adult-sized, and it was difficult for the children to use them. Sunny could scarcely lift her debarker and all at all and so used her teeth instead but violet and klaus had teeth of only an average sharpness and so had to struggle with the debarkers the three children scraped and scraped but only tiny pieces of bark fell from the tree for another thing the children had not eaten any breakfast and as the morning wore on they were so hungry that it was difficult to even lift the debarker let alone scrape it against the tree and for one more thing once a tree was finally cleared of bark the pinchers would drop another one onto the ground and they would have to start all over again which was extremely boring but for the worst thing of all, the noise at the Lucky Smells lumber mill was simply deafening. The debarkers made their displeasing scraping sound as they dragged across the trees. The pinchers made their rough whistling noise as they picked up logs. And Foreman Flacutono made his horrendous clanging noise as he banged his pots together. The orphans grew exhausted and frustrated. Their stomachs hurt and their ears rang and they were unbelievably bored. Finally, as the employees finished their 14th log, Foreman Flacatono banged his pots together and shouted, LUNCH BREAK! The workers stopped scraping, and the pincher stopped whistling, and everyone sat down exhausted on the ground. Foreman Flacatono threw his pots on the floor, walked over to tiny green boxes, and grabbed one. Opening it with a rip, he began to toss small pink squares at the workers, one to each. You got five minutes for lunch, he shouted, throwing three pink squares at the children. The Baudelaire's could see that a damp patch had appeared on his surgical mask from spit flying out of his mouth as he gave orders. Just five minutes! Violet looked from the damp patch on the mask to the pink square in her hand, and for a second she didn't believe what she was looking at. It's gum, she said. This is gum? Klaus looked from his sister's square to his own. Gum isn't lunch, he cried. Gum isn't even a snack. Tanko, Sonny shrieked, which meant something along the lines of, and babies shouldn't even have gum because they could choke on it. You'd better eat your gum, Phil said, moving over to sit next to the children. It's not very filling, but it's the only thing they'll let you eat until dinner time. Maybe we could get up a little earlier tomorrow, Violet said, and make some sandwiches. We don't have any sandwich-making ingredients, Phil said. We just get one meal, usually a casserole, every evening. Well, maybe we could go into town and buy some ingredients, Klaus said. I wish we could, Phil said, but we don't have any money. What about your wages? Violet asked. Surely you can spend some of the money you earn on sandwich ingredients. Phil gave the children a sad smile and reached into his pocket. At the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, he said, bringing out a bunch of tiny scraps of paper. They don't pay us in money. They pay us in coupons. See, here's what we all earned yesterday. 20% off a of shampoo at Sam's Haircutting Palace. The day before that was a... We earned a coupon for a free refill of iced tea, and last week we earned this one. Buy two banjos and get one free. The trouble is we can't buy two banjos because we don't have anything but these coupons. 
Nell knew, Sonny shrieked, but Foreman Flacatona began banging his pots together before anyone could realize what she meant. Lunch is over, he shouted. Back to work, everyone. Everyone except you, bottle lumps. The boss wants to see you three in his office right away. The three siblings put down their debarkers and looked at one another. They'd been working so hard they'd almost forgotten about meeting their guardian, whatever his name was. What sort of man would force small children to work in a lumber mill? What sort of man would hire a monster like Foreman Flacatono? What sort of man would pay his employees in coupons or feed them only gum? Foreman Flacatono banged his pots together again and pointed at the door, and the children stepped out of the noisy room into the quiet of the courtyard. Klaus took the map out of his pocket and pointed the way t to the office. With each step, the orphans raised small clouds of dirt that matched the clouds of dread hovering over them. Their bodies ached from the morning's work, and they had an uneasy feeling in their empty stomachs. As they had guessed from the way their day began, the three children were having a bad day, but as they got closer and closer to the office, they wondered if their day was about to get even worse. End of chapter three. You're ambidextrous with footedness and sports. That's pretty cool. Oh, Cammy, thank you so much for the host. How are you? Get Ambi, bro. Yay, series of unfortunate events. What a debarkle. Ha ha. Baby barely has teeth for gum, mainly just has gums. Coupons for ex egos. Stranger things of life. I see you. Hey, Exile, how are you doing tonight? I hope you're having a wonderful Friday night. You're spooper cold? I'm pretty good, too. I'm getting better from my wee weird week. High of 27. Holy cow. You northerners, I always feel so sorry for. And then I'm sure you guys probably feel sorry for us in the dead of summer. It's so cold. It's cold all around. It was comfortably chilly today for us, which means it was probably unbelievably cold for a lot of you. I'm in like a sweater. <clears throat> we only have one more chapter to do today. I am... How long have I been streaming? What's my uptime? Let me see. 46 minutes. Not bad. I'm I'm good. I'm pretty good. Thank you for asking. All right, I'm going to do my last chapter and then we'll see. We'll see what I do tonight. I might do something else, but we'll see. Chapter 4. As I'm sure you know, whenever there's a mirror around, it is almost impossible not to take a look at yourself. Even though we all know what we look like, we all like just to look at our reflections, if only to see how we're doing. As the Baudelaire orphans waited outside the office to meet their new guardian, they looked in a mirror hanging in the hallway and they saw at once that they were not doing so well. The children looked tired and they looked hungry. Violet's hair was covered in small pieces of bark, Klaus's glasses were hanging askew, a phrase which here means tilted to one side from leaning over logs the entire morning, and there were small pieces of wood stuck in Sunny's four teeth from using them as debarkers. Behind them, reflected in the mirror, was a painting of the seashore which was hanging on the opposite wall, which made them feel even worse, because the seashore always made them remember that terrible, terrible day when the three siblings went to the beach and soon received the news from Mr. Poe that their parents had died. The children stared at their own reflections and stared at the painting of the seashore behind them, and it was almost unbearable to think about everything that had happened to them since that day. If someone had told me, Violet said, that day at the beach, that, long, that before long I'd find myself living at the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, I would have said they were crazy. If someone had told me, Klaus said, that day at the beach, that before long I'd find myself pursued by a greedy, evil man named Count Olaf, I would have said they were insane. Laura, Sonny said, which meant something like, if someone had told me that day at the beach that before long I'd find myself using my four teeth to scrape the bark off trees, I would have said they were psychoneurotically disturbed. Wow, Sonny. 
The dismayed orphans looked at their ref reflections, and their dismayed reflections looked back at them. For several moments, the Baudelaire stood and pondered the mysterious ways their, li their lives were going, and they were thinking so hard about it that they jumped a little when someone spoke. You must be Violet Klaus and Sunny Baudelaire, the somebody said, and their the children turned to see a very tall man with very short hair. He was wearing a bright blue vest and holding a peach. He smiled and walked toward them, but then frowned as he drew closer. Why, you're covered in pieces of bark, he said. I hope you haven't been hanging around the lumber mill. That could be very dangerous for small children. Violet looked at the peach and wondered if she dared ask for a bite. We've been working there all morning, she said. The man frowned. Working there? Klaus looked at the peach and had to stop himself from grabbing it right out of the man's hand. Yes, he said. We received your instructions and went right to work. Today was a new log day. The man scratched his head. Instructions? he asked. What in the world are you talking about? Sunny looked at the peach and it was all she could do not to leap up and sink her teeth right into it. Molub, she said, which meant something, which must have meant something like, we're talking about the typed note that told us to go to work at the lumber mill? Well, I don't understand how three people as young as yourselves were put to work in the lumber mill, but please accept my humblest apologies, and let me tell you that it will not happen again. Why, your children, for goodness sake, you will be treated as members of the family. The orphans looked at one another. Could it be that their horrible experiences in Paltryville were just a mistake? You mean we don't have to debark any more logs? Violet asked. Of course not, the man said. I can't believe you were even allowed inside. Why, there are some very nasty machines in there. I'm going to speak to your new guardian about that immediately. You're not our new guardian? Klaus asked. Oh, no, the man said. Forgive me for not introducing myself. My name is Charles, and it's very nice to have the three of you here at Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. It's very nice to be here, Violet lied politely. I find that difficult to believe, Charles said, seeing as you've been forced to work in the mill, but let's put that behind us and have a fresh start. Would you ha care for a peach? They've had their lunch, came a booming voice, and the orphans whirled around and stared at the man they saw. He was quite short, shorter than Klaus, and dressed in a suit made of a very shiny, dark green material that made him look more like a reptile than a person. But what made them stare most was his face, or rather the cloud of smoke that was covering his face. The man was smoking a cigar, and the smoke from the cigar covered his entire head. The cloud of smoke made the Baudelaire children very curious as to what his face really looked like, and you may be curious as well, but you will have to take that curiosity to your grave, for I will tell you now, before we go any further, that the Baudelaire's never saw this man's face, and neither did I, and neither will you. Oh, hello, sir, Charles said. I was just meeting the Baudelaire children. Did you know they'd arrived? Of course I knew they arrived, the smoke-faced man said. I'm not an idiot. No, of course not, Charles said, but were you aware that they were put to work in the lumber mill? On a new log day, no less. I was just explaining to them what a terrible mistake that was. It wasn't a mistake, the man said. I don't make mistakes, Charles. I'm not an idiot. He turned so the cloud of smoke faced the children. Hello, Baudelaire orphans. I thought we should lay eyes on one another. Batex, Sunny said, which probably meant, but we're not laying eyes on, on one another. I have no time to talk about that. The man said, I see you met Charles. He's my partner. We split everything 50-50, which is a pretty good deal. Don't you think so? I guess so, Klaus said. I don't know very much about the lumber business. Oh, yes, Charles said. Of course I think it's a good deal. Well, the man said, I want to give you three a good deal as well. Now I heard about what happened to your parents, which is really too bad. And I heard all about this Count Olaf fellow who sounds like quite a jerk and those odd-looking people who work for him. So when Mr. Poe gave me a call, I worked out a deal. The deal is this. I will try to make sure that Count Olaf and his associates never go anywhere near you, and you will work in my lumber mill until you come of age and get all your money. Is that a fair deal? The Baudelaire orphans did not answer this question because it seemed to them the answer was obvious. A fair deal, as everyone knows, is when both people give something of more or less equal value. If you were bored with playing with your chemistry set and you give it to your brother in exchange for his dollhouse, that would be a fair deal. If someone offered to smuggle me out of the country in her sailboat in exchange for free tickets to an ice show, that would be a fair deal. But working for years in a lumber mill in exchange for the owners trying to keep Count Olaf away is an enormously unfair deal, and the three youngsters knew that. Sir, Charles said, smiling nervously at the Baudelaire's. You can't be serious. A lumber mill is no place for small children to work. Of course it is, the man said. He reached a hand up to his, into his cloud to scratch an itch somewhere on his face. It will teach them responsibility, it will teach them the value of work, and it will teach them how to make flat wooden boards out of trees. 
Well, you probably know best, Charles said, shrugging. But we could read about all of those things, Klaus said, and learn about them that way. That's true, sir, Charles said. They could study in the library. They seem very well behaved, and I'm sure they would cause no trouble. Your library, the man said sharply. What nonsense. Do not listen to... Don't listen to Charles, you children. My partner has insisted we create a library for the employees at the mill, and so I let him, but it is no substitute for hard work. Please, sir, Violet pleaded. At least let our little sister stay in the dormitory. She's only a baby. I have offered you a very good deal, the man said. As long as you stay within the gates of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill, this Count Olaf will not come near you. In addition, I'm giving you a place to sleep, a nice hot dinner, and a stick of gum for lunch. And all you have to do in return is a few years' work. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Well, it was nice to meet you. Unless you have any questions, I'll be going now. My pizza's getting cold, and if there's one thing I hate, it's a cold lunch. I do have a question, Violet said, although the truth of the matter is she had many questions. Most of them begin with the fra phrase, how can you? How can you force small children to work in a lumber mill was one of them. How can you treat us so horribly after all we've been through was another. And then there was how can you pay your employees in coupons instead of money and how can you feed us only gum for lunch and how can you stand to have a cloud of smoke covering your face. But none of these seemed like questions that were proper to ask at that moment. So Violet looked at her new guardian right in his cloud and asked what is your name. Never mind what my name is the man said no one can pronounce it anyway so just call me sir. I'll show the children to the door, sir, Charles said quickly, and with a wave of his hand, the owner of the Lucky Smells Lumber Mill was gone. Charles waited nervously for a moment to make sure sir was far enough away. Then he leaned into the children and handed them the peach. Never mind what he said about you already having your lunch, he said. Have this peach. Thank you, Klaus cried, and hurriedly divided the peach among himself and his siblings, giving the biggest piece to Sunny because she hadn't even had her gum. The Budler children were wolfed down the peach, and under Nurk and under normal circumstances, it would not have been polite to eat something so quickly and so noisily, particularly in front of someone they did not know very well. But these circumstances were not at all normal, so even a manners expert would excuse them for their gobbling. You know, Charles said, because you seem like such nice children, and because you've worked so very hard today, I'm going to do something for you. Can you guess what that is? Talk to Sir, Violet said, wiping peach juice off her chin, and convince him that we shouldn't work in the lumber mill? Well, no, Charles admitted. That wouldn't do any good. He won't listen to me. But you're his partner, Klaus pointed out. That doesn't matter, Charles replied. When Sir's made up his mind, he's made up his mind. I know he sometimes is a little bit mean, but you'll have to excuse him. He had a very terrible childhood. Do you understand? Violet looked at the painting of the seashore and thought once again of that dreadful day on the beach. Yes, she sighed. I understand because I think I'm having a very terrible childhood myself. Well, I know it will make you feel better, Charles said, at least a little bit. Let me show you the library before you go back to work. Then you can visit it whenever you want. Come on, it's right down the hall. Charles led the Bodlers down the hallway, and even though they would be soon back at work, even though they had been offered one of the least fair deals ever offered to children, the three siblings felt a little bit better. Whether it was Uncle Monty's library of reptile books, or Aunt Josephine's library of grammar books, or Justice Strauss's library of law books, or best of all, their parents' library of all kinds of books, all burned up now, alas. Libraries always made them feel a little bit better. Just knowing they could read made the Bodler orphans feel as if their wretched lives could be a little bit brighter. At the end of the hallway was a little door, and Charles stopped at the door, smiled at the children, and opened the door. The library was a large room, and it was filled with elegant wooden bookshelves and comfortable-looking sofas on which to sit and read. On one wall was a row of windows which let in more than enough light for reading, and on the other wall was a row of landscape paintings perfect for resting one's eyes. The Bodler children stepped inside the room and took a good look around, but they did not feel any better. Not at all. "'Where are the books?' Klaus asked. "'All these elegant bookshelves are empty.' That's the only thing wrong with this library, Charles admitted. Sir wouldn't give me any money to buy books. You mean there are no books at all? Violet asked. Just three, Charles said and walked to the farthest bookshelf. There on the bottom shelf were three books sitting all by themselves. Without money, of course, it was difficult to acquire any books, but I did have three books donated. Sir donated his book, The History of Lucky Smells Lumber Mill. The mayor of Paltryville donated this book, The Paltryville Constitution. And here's Advanced Ocular Science, don donated by Dr. Orwell, a doctor who lives in town. Charles held up the three books to show the Bodlers what each one looked like, and the children stared in dismay and fear. 
The history of Lucky Smell's lumber mill had a painting of Sir on the cover, with a cloud of smoke covering his face. The Paltryville Constitution had a photograph of the Paltryville Post Office, with the old shoe dangling from the flagpole in front, but it was the cover of Advanced Ocular Science that made the chil Bodler children stare. You have heard many times, I'm sure, that you should not judge a book by its cover. But just as it is difficult to believe that a man who is not a doctor wearing a surgical mask and a white wig will turn out to be a charming person, it was difficult for the children to believe that advanced ocular science was going to cause them anything but trouble. The word ocular, you might know, means related to the eye, but even if you did not know this, you could figure it out from the cover. For printed on the cover was an image that the children recognized. They recognized it from their own nightmares and from personal experience. It was an image of an eye and the Bodler orphans recognized it as the mark of Count Olaf. All right. That was the end of chapter four, which is the last chapter I'll be reading in this session. Hello, Arctic Marty Bum. Welcome to my channel. My name's V. Um, I do book streams as well as a variety of other things, but I hope you're having a wonderful Friday night. And thanks for joining us disembark from the debarking. Hi Raz, how are you doing? Hey Dolan. Poor lonesome books, yeah. All right, well that's the end of that. I was debating possibly starting Labyrinth of Lies tonight as well, but I'm still kind of recouping from my crazy week. Um, so I think I'm actually just going to call it here for, this, for tonight. I know it was kind of a shorter stream, but um, I'll just be lurking around on stream uh, or on Twitch. So let me see if anybody's streaming right now that I would want to. Uh... Yeah, um, we're actually going to do a, I don't have a raid like message or anything like that, but I'm actually just going to send everybody over to my check buddy. Tom um, is streaming right now. Uh, so we're going to go, so I'm going to pop in and support him for a few minutes. Uh, thank you guys for all being here. Um, so the next stream I do will be beginning uh, the Labyrinth of Lies. Um, and then I'll be trading off Labyrinth of Lies with book reading. Um, so the next stream for Lemony Snicket won't be too far off. So just uh, hang out with me. Um, and I'll see you all soon. Again, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Take care of yourselves, guys. I'll see you very soon. I'll see you around. I'm going to uh, throw a raid to Tom. And then uh, we will... Let's see. Raid. Oi, win. I'm going to send this. And I'll see you guys over there in just a sec.